Welcome all and thank you for joining today's session. My name is Michael Downey. Uh, before we jump into today's webinar on autonomous robots and electric tra tractors, a couple of very quick reminders for anyone new to AWRI webinars. If you would like to provide a comment or a question, please uh, open the Q&A button in your toolbar, type your question in and send it through. We will be running a dedicated Q&A at the end of today's presentation, but please feel, please feel free to shoot through your questions at any stage. Also, this webinar is being recorded and it will be available to view via the AWRI's YouTube channel. For those of you that have just joined, welcome. Today's webinar takes a look at recent developments in autonomous vineyard robots and electric tractors, and it's fantastic to have the AWRI's Dr. Simon Nordisgaard here to shed some insights around this topic. Simon is a senior engineer at the AWRI, has worked in wine industry research and development for more than a decade, has a passion for innovation and has been involved in many projects relating to wine production processes and equipment. Simon, it's fantastic to have your expertise on hand and if you're ready, I'll get you to take it away. All right, thanks, thanks, Michael, and, and thanks everybody for, for attending. Um, so, yeah, as Michael said, I'm, today I'm going to give a, a bit of a summary of what's happening in uh, autonomous robots and electric tractors. Uh, just, to, just to start off with, uh, there was a, a recent ASVO uh, winning the long game seminar that I, that I really enjoyed, and I've, I've included a screenshot from one of the sessions that shows the results from a a survey of attendees on what emerging technologies um, they believe will be mainstream in the Australian wine industry in, in 2050. And, um, and one thing that sort of stood out to me really is that, uh, you, know, it, you know, these word clouds work, the bigger widening means more respondents mentioned that thing, but what really stands out is that, that uh, um, how commonly things like autonomous vehicles, robots, electric tractors, uh, renewable energy and stuff, uh, I uh, 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 mentioned it's, it's it shows that, that most people think that this is is, is what's coming. Um, there, and there there's a lot of interest and developments going on in this in this space. There's a there's a, there's there's a lot of work going on in France, in particular on on, on vineyard robots. Um, the most recent big uh, international vineyard equipment trade show was Cetevi in Montpellier like, um, uh, late last year, and they had uh, three vineyard robots on display. Um, that are that are all sort of close or early in early commercialization. Um, there's also things going on like uh, uh, quite applied uh, annual, agri annual agri agricultural robotics conference um, that's held every year. Um, that's been going since 2016 in France. Um, I guess what's uh, what's what's driving this this uh, this interest on on, on vineyard robots. Um, and I think the the big one seems to be interest in alternatives to herbicide for undervine um, weed management. Um, undervine cultivation um, is a lot more effort than using herbicide, so people are interested in ways to better automate that if that technique has to be used. Um, and a lot of the equipment being developed is is focused on this um, in the in the in the first instance. You can even see in the pictures on the on the on the left that. Uh, um, a lot of the equipment has an over the row configuration, partly to facilitate good alignment of under, under, under vine cultivation tools around the, the vines. Um, there's of course always uh, interest in anything that might reduce uh, vineyard, uh, costs of other vineyard operations as well. Um, and uh, worker health and safety is another, another driver. Um, perhaps more so for some of the open cab tractors where the user is uh, potentially more exposed to, to sprays. Um, so going through those three robots, um, this is the TED from, from NIO, um, it's battery powered, can go at up to four kilometers an hour. Um, it's currently for undervine cultivation, as you saw some of that, that those sort of, uh, equipment in that, in that, uh, in that, uh, in that, in that, 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 that video. Um, it's, uh, the NIO seems to be a bit of, have been a bit of a pioneer in the French agricultural robotics. They founded that agricultural robotics conference I mentioned back in 2016, and they've got a few different bits of equipment. Um, this particular one's not 
commercially available yet, but they have quite a lot of vineyards working on continuing R&D uh, projects. Um, like a lot of these machines, um, you need to have a, a you know an accurate uh, GNSS GPS map of the of the vineyard, um, either from when it was planted or or from a drone survey. Um, you then set the path you want the 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 robot to take based on this, and then the robots tend to use some sort of uh, other sensors to assist a bit with guidance and and obstacle detection. The robots are placed in the vineyard to. To, to start off with and you get notification messages to advise of stoppages, battery levels, etc. Um, most of these, these robots don't return to a, a docking station to, to charge automatically, like some of the domestic grade autonomous electric lawnmowers that you can buy, but I'm sure this could be possible in the future. It's, that's, that's probably more of an issue of, of having a way to travel between vineyards and a central charging location without having to go on, on public roads more than, more than anything else. So this is a this is another one of these robots. This is the the Vidibot um, Bacchus. Again, it's powered by lithium lithium batteries. Um, comes in two different two different sizes. Um, so this is this is this the bit in the video here is it's going at three times speed. Um, a lot of these a lot of these robots is probably the the, the place where they're the the slowest is that is the is the turning to go. Um, uh, uh, at the end, end, of, end of the rows, um, because I guess that's, that's where the, the most complex uh, navigation um, is involved. Um, so as I said, it comes in two different sizes. This is the bigger, the bigger size uh, now. Um, but actually, you probably have, people might have seen one of the earlier versions of the of it that had a solar panel on 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 the top. It was enclosed, but they 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 got rid of that in the new versions because. Um, it, not having that there uh, gives them more flexibility to 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 do different uh, sizes, and it wasn't producing a huge amount of electricity. And you can you can um, you, you can still be uh, com powered completely re renewably. You just have a solar panel somewhere else that uh, you know a large a larger amount of solar panel somewhere else that is used to to charge the the robot. I guess with all these sort of uh, robots, if we're if they're imported into Australia, you probably need to make sure that they suit our vine sizes and, and canopy types. Um, and you might need to make some, some modifications to, to achieve that. Um, this one's quite interesting in that also in that the, uh, the, the tools are, are all electric um, and they had to design them all them, them, themselves um, since the electric tools weren't, um, already available. Um, these um, these are being uh, now starting to be sold in France from this year, and they've they've got ten more than ten in in use in in vineyards. So this is a some a close up view of the of the undervine um, cultivation and mid row uh, mowing mowing tools, sort of on, on one half of the of the of, of the robot. Um, and this this here is a a picture from uh, the, of uh, their prototype recycle sprayer from Sotevi last year, um, and they're going to release a, 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 a series version uh, of, of of this soon. Um, this is that third uh, uh, robot, the 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 the, the tractor from Citia. Um, unlike the others, this is, this is actually a diesel electric uh, hybrid. Um, has an uh, adjustable width and they're, and they're promoting that it could fit between rows, not just uh, over rows. And they're also not, not just aiming at, uh, at, at vineyards, they're, uh, they're looking at other crops as well. And I guess that's why they've named it something a bit like tractor to try to pr promote that multi-purpose nature. Um, their strategy is that uh, you can use it with your own implements and, um, and, and, and it's, uh, and, it's got a it's got a hydraulic um, pump and um, it can supply 25 liters per minute of hydraulic oil um, and there's also uh, uh, 15 kilowatts of uh, of electric power available for implements as as well. Um, this uh, the choice of some of the ro the robot manufacturers as to whether they develop their own implements or work with existing implements is a bit of a point of difference between some of the the machines and and to be fair there's probably arguments could be made on 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 both sides um the ability to work with existing implements um 
could uh, could make the robots more flexible and easier to adopt and it also takes some pressure off the companies doing the development because none of this is easy and it's it's one more thing to do i guess the counter argument is that specifically design implements may provide a more seamless integration and prevent issues that might arise from using simple implements that were i guess were designed assuming that there's always going to be somebody in a, a tractor in, in front of them to s stop and fix it if something goes wrong this is a this is another another vineyard robot that's being developed in France. Um, like the tractor, it's a it's a diesel electric hybrid. Um, they're also aiming to work with existing implements. It's not commercially available yet. Um, apart from this robot, a green culture are also developing another robot in collaboration with Palenque as part of a robotics competition in Champagne. That's uh, that's quite interesting in itself. Um, so in 2018, the Champagne Regional Body launched a competition, developed vineyard robots for the Champagne region as part of a, a sustainability initiative. And, um, and uh, this was an interesting approach. And, and from some mentions on the internet, I understand that a Green Culture and Palenque and, and, and also uh, Vidibot have sort of progressed in the next stage of that. So not all the um, agricultural robots are uh, are electric um, at all. Um, this is uh, this one's not uh, being used in vineyards, but uh, I sort of thought I'd um, include it because it's some of the development shows some interesting perspective. Um, this uh, the Agrotelli Agri Agro and Telly Roboti was um, actually they started off um, developing it with batteries, but they ended up going to to, to diesel engines. Um, apart from wanting to work for long periods and need to, um, needing to sort of drag larger implements around, they found that the, uh, the use of uh, diesel and hydraulics like a traditional tractor made it quite popular with farmers because they were already familiar with these technologies and able to, to, you know, to work, on the, work on the equipment. Um, since they've been reasonably successful and they've, they've sold more than um, 20 of them and half of them have been uh, delivered. Um, Using autonomous robots that can potentially work day and night um, does present some interesting opportunities to do things uh, differently than might not have uh, that might not have previously been um, possible. Um, for example, some operations might be able to perform with um, single row instead of multi row equipment. Um, um, it's slower, but if it can run for longer periods, um, it might still work. Um, uh, some operations like mowing that might be currently perform severely a few times, might be able to perform mildly, very, very frequently. Um, there's, there's some really interesting work um, being done at the French uh, Institute of Vine and Wine Research, where they're looking at, um, uh, at, at the question of what effect uh, uh, mowing um, very, very frequently at a high level um, versus mowing severely less often has on competition between um, you know, undervine uh, weeds and, and vines for, for, for water and, and nutrients um, and whether uh, um, and whether undervine mowing might possibly uh, with, with that sort of strategy might um, might be uh, um, another way of, uh, of, 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 of managing under, undervine undervine weeds so uh, one of the uh, one of the very first this, this is the the Vidi Rover. Um, it was actually one of the very first vineyard robots that was um, that was developed. At, uh, it won an award at the Vinitech CFO in 2012, and there's 100 or so of them in use, and they're, they're building more. And, and currently, these are, 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 uh, are not being sold directly. They're they're being offered as a, a service at a dollar per hectare rate. Um, and um, yeah, so if 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 uh, if it turned out that you could um, get different results if you um, uh, and and with um, frequent mowing at a high level, um, and um, and that that didn't uh, take away those that stop weeds taking away um, water and nutrients from the um, uh, vine more so than normal mowing strategies, then um, then that could be another another approach to under vine. Um, uh, Undervine weed management. The results are, are not probably not definitive yet, but it's really interesting because we've seen, as you've seen, a lot of the other robots are essentially managing undervine weeds through cultivation, um, which even if it is automated, you know, can have its own problems. It's you know, potentially damaging some vine trunks, roots, amongst other things, and it, it's uh, 
I guess under vine cultivation, it's probably it's a bit controversial in itself, and there seems to be some diversity of opinions. I, I to be honest, I, I don't know enough about it to make any definitive comments uh, myself. Um, this is a this is this is not a vineyard um, robot again, but I'm including it because it's um, of the precision spraying aspect. Um, many agriculture robots that are being developed. Uh, 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 are working on sort of green on green with green on green recognition systems. Um, this one uses a precision spaying as the way to kill the identified weeds, but there's other ways that, that, are, that are also used by similar robots to, to, to deal with the weeds. Um, the thing about the precision spraying is it allows for very small volumes of herbicide to be used um, and prevents needing to be carry around large volumes of liquid. Um, which can be useful for some of these robots because um, that makes them heavy and can be a, a drain on, on, on batteries. Um, in vineyards, I was, I was wondering, you know, could this sort of technology be applied for, for, for canopy sprays potentially as, as well? Um, I guess, I, I mean, it's probably, it's interesting, but um, it's probably not, um, I guess, because it's uh, Many canopy sprays are more protectant, protectant than, than curative, but I, I think it's it's an interesting technology and something that's happening. So the major tractor manufacturers are also working in this uh, on various autonomous tractor concepts. I've got just a few here. I guess with these sorts of things, some of them are probably more aspirational and R and D rather than something that's going to be immediately applicable. But it's quite interesting. Um, Think about broad acre farming. Uh, productivity increases for a long time have been really driven by larger implements and correspondingly larger tractors to drag them around, um, which has led to increased productivity per driver, but also soil compaction. And, and many proponents of small robots, you know, note that once you, the driver's removed, um, then it shows the need to have such a big machine. One person could instead manage many smaller machines, a, a swarm. So uh, Agco Fent have got one of their, a swarm concept there. And I mean, a lot of other people are, are sort of working on that, that, that sort of theory as well. Um, one other sort of interesting thing, looking at some of these, these autonomous tractors with no cab. Um, if you develop an autonomous vehicle, does, do you, um, an autonomous tractor, do you, do you put a cab on it or not? Um, I guess removing the cab likely makes the vehicle slightly cheaper, but it also removes the possibility of ever being able to drive it manually. Um, and it seems um, for larger autonomous vehicles, most likely they'll retain Am I, can you hear me now? How much do we, do we, how far yeah, do I go back? We lost your audio there for about 20 seconds or so. So perhaps uh, just backtrack a little bit. So I'm only on this slide. Yep. So, um, so I was just talking about uh, um, if you're developing a, an autonomous vehicle, whether you put a cab on it or, or, or not, um, if you don't have a cab, it makes it uh, slightly cheaper, but it, it you don't, you, you can't drive it. Um, uh, uh, don't have that ability to, to run it run it normally, run it manually um, if you want to do that. Um, so I mean for larger autonomous vehicles it, it seems most likely that retain cabs for, for a long time to give the user the flexibility. Um, for the purpose of concept vehicles though it makes a lot of sense to have to not have a cab because it communicates it's a, that um, that uh, uh, it's it's an autonomous vehicle. Um, so on the top of some of existing tractors when considering some of these new ro robots, I think it's important to also consider that there's actually quite a lot of automation already available for some tractors, particularly um, larger tractors. Um, and autonomy itself is a bit of a spectrum. For on-road vehicles, um, the, the Society of Automotive Engineers has come up with some, some different classifications to describe the levels of autonomy. And these have, have become quite commonly accepted and they're also intermittently applied to agricultural autonomous vehicles. Um, I guess Tesla, which is probably the media symbol of, I mean, the popular symbol of autonomy is, is still only at autonomy level two, partial automation, perhaps 
pushing towards the top of that. Um, and of course, they've also got ambitions to go to full self self driving vehicles. But if we look at agricultural vehicles, I mean, they uh, GPS auto steer was um, for tractors was actually commercially developed by an Australian company as a retrokit for, for kit for tractors way back in 1997. And, and some of the major tractor manufacturers probably reached what could be classified as level three um, automation around a decade ago. Um, although the environments they're working in are probably less complex than than the the, the on-road conditions that um, that um, on-road vehicles have to have to would have to have to deal with um, so on that existing tractor automation let's talk briefly about auto steer it's a, I mean it, it's a bit of an Australian success story story given that it was sort of first commercially developed here and it, it seems it seems like something that's used a lot more in broad acre farming than than in vineyards sort of um, anecdotally, anecdotally any, any, anyway, um, of all the precision agricultural uh, techniques, it's the one that's been most widely adopted. Just thinking about why this is, um, it's allowed controlled traffic farming where big tractors are, are um, directed to always go on the same tracks and therefore limit um, wider spread soil compaction, um, helps reduce overlaps because you, I guess you people be more confident where the edge of the, uh, the edge of the machinery is and not and not always overlapping a, a little bit to make sure they get they get everything um, and also helps with fatigue management um, and as I said that seems likely that that adoption in vineyards is a bit lower um, um, but you know but some companies are using it and are finding it really worth really worthwhile and I, I guess some of the reasons that it's probably not widely adopted in vineyards is that we uh, we're working with permanent crops organized in rows that you can't can't cross but there's still the that fatigue um, management um, uh, advantage that probably shouldn't be un, understated um if the driver's less fatigued they'll potentially do a better job and, and make less mistakes and they can focus on optimizing other implements i've noticed that also that some other some camera based auto steering systems seem to now be being launched on um, grape harvesters and, and they've been around in other forms for some time as well um, i guess the motivation is probably um providing an auto steering solution that doesn't need a base station or ongoing subscriptions for satellite positioning. But there's probably a little bit of uncertainty about how well they might work and if the canopy is not perfectly neat and symmetrical. And on that satellite um, positioning, um, I, I think there's, there's other advantages to that as well. Maybe it might cost a little bit more, but it's sort of a gateway to uh, precision and automation that you, you might not get with a, um, a, a vision system just suiting one, um, one application. I guess once you're doing things with satellite positioning, you can do things like track to operation, uh, tracking operations, turning track to implements on and off based on position, stuff like that. So there are also retrofit kits available for existing um, tractors um, that can make them autonomous. One company that seemed to do, have done quite a bit on this was um, Precision Makers. They automated lots of sports ground mowers as well as around 40 um, tractors, mainly Fent Orchard tractors it seems. Um, there were at least three tractor conversions formed in Australia I understand. Um, um, from some of the videos this uh, seemed to be reasonably um, integrated with the tractor electronics. Um, there's a report on the internet that they used to have some problems um, where the, when the tractor, um, a few times when the tractors have been serviced by the dealer and the software will be updated and then the automation um, retrofit um, wouldn't work anymore and then they'd have to have to fix it. Um, and, and based on that report and, and looking at their website, they appear no longer to be selling new systems. This is another retrofit kit that's available, uh, now available from a company called GoTrack in, in, in Poland. Um, they say their system should be able to be um, fitted to any f tractor with a power steering, not just new tractors. Um, it, from some of the pictures, it perhaps doesn't look quite as integrated with the tractor electronics, which could actually be a good thing given those issues mentioned with the tractor manufacturer um, updates. Um, and when you use this system, um, basically the user drives the path and then it's recorded in the system and the next time it can be repeated autonomously. Um, Precision Maker system appears to have also worked with that sort of teach and playback setup as well. Um, they've also mentioned in other presentations that they had a another advanced plant path planning option, but I'm not sure if that was for, for, for tractors or more for the sports ground mowing equipment. Um, 
I guess some sort of which which there's there's autonomous vehicle developments in in in, in lots of different cropping sectors, and I guess um, which sectors are going to be uh, 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 likely to uh, uh, and business types are likely to adopt them first. And I guess probably the easiest place to adopt them is is uh, is where large amounts of manual labour are still employed. Um, one example: of small scale vegetable growing. Um, 120 of these uh, of these NIO Oz weeding and towing robots are now in operation. Um, another example of a sort of a reasonably priced robot is the the burro in the in the USA. Burro is Spanish for 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 a donkey. This this is a fruit carrying and towing um, robot. It's primarily primarily used to transport hand picked fruit from the picking row to a to a packing table, meaning that the productivity of the of the um, of the of the pickers can be um, increased and um, uh, I guess looking at other industries, some of the biggest savings from um, robotization could potentially be from fully automating um, fruit fresh fruit picking. Um, but this is a much this is a pretty complex task for a machine to perform for many fresh fruits and. It, seems uh, likely that it probably won't be widespread for a long time. I guess, furthermore, for fruits that are to be processed into liquid products, such as grapes for winemaking, mechanical systems, you know, machine harvesting have, have generally already been developed and replaced most hand picking, limiting the gains from further automation. Major tractor manufacturers, when they, they present about automation, they, they tend to um, say that, you know, broad acre farming is not, is not going to be an adopter of, of, of of complete automization because um, because of the uh, the scale of the equipment, meaning their labour costs are already only a small proportion of those farms' costs, and and because broadacre tractors already have a, have a degree of autonomy, um, but it's it's not impossible that those sort of farms might be relatively quick to adopt some of the new technologies, given their experience with fairly advanced tractor and harvester technologies and. And the fact that they're sometimes located in quite remote areas where safety risk concerns regarding autonomous vehicles would, would, would be would be lower. Um, so, in the wine industry, uh, it's as I've already sort of gone through some of the mechanical um, undervine, you know, weeding, mowing robots um, seem to be the uh, the most likely first first step. Canopy spraying, um, maybe after that. Um, and it's probably businesses with multiple tractors that um, could could benefit most. I mean, you can you can move to a to a situation where you have a fleet of autonomous tractors, robots, and you know one person managing them. Um, the the two the biggest safety risks with autonomous uh, robots and tractors are, is is really that they could leave the field or or hurt or or hurt somebody. Um, and I guess it is important to say that you know, if in any trials or other applications, it's it's critical that, that frameworks are in place to prevent this um, happening. But but I think it's also important to keep things in perspective because um, if we look at uh, um, some some data from Safe Work Australia, while uh, agriculture makes up 2.3 percent of the workforce, accounts for 23 percent of worker fatalities and three quarters of those um, fatalities in, in, involve vehicles. Um, so in the, in, the, in the long term, as technology matures, it's likely autonomous robots and tractors will end up making farming operations safer rather than more dangerous. Um, um, and provided that uh, uh, autonomous vehicles stay on, um, on private property, the, the specific rules surrounding these uh, surrounding the use of autonomous vehicles seem to be quite um, limited. Um, there's, of course, still legal consequences if um, uh, if, if 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 something does um, does happen. So, um, and uh, Wiseman and Al provide some some discussion about that. I think for new vineyard applications, it's it is probably worth considering uh, if you're, if you're planning new vineyards or doing major redevelopments, it's probably worth considering how um, autonomous robots might fit in. Um, it's, uh, I mean, it seems likely that, it, that as much as possible might be good to have some sort of central charging, docking, loading station, and then um, private paths between vineyard blocks and the station as much as possible. So theoretically, robots could, could go to 
to, to vineyards and, um, and, and, and back to the charging station when, they, um, when, they, uh, when the battery's going flat. So changing a topic a, a, a little bit, I mean, it's, it's related, but um, electri tractor electri and implement electrification. And I, I'm, why? Um, why would we do it? I guess for tractors, um, big things, uh, using renewable energy and um, solar, wind, et cetera, instead of diesel. Um, and then looking at how we power um, implements attached to tractors, I guess it's the same thing again, energy from, from renewables. But then there's also the, the, uh, the topic of um, more energy e efficient um, and uh, higher energy e efficiency and, and precision that electrical motors with appropriate drives can, can realize compared with hydraulic systems. Um, and when you when you look back at some of the um, the work of the major tractor manufacturers and what they present um, publish on the internet and stuff that they've done at trade shows and things, they've 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 been working a lot on this for the last twenty years or so. Um, Fent and John Deere in particular seem to have been done a, done a lot of work. Um, I guess a big thing with um, with uh, with uh, um, electrically powered vehicles is the the battery energy um, density. Um, uh, so one of the great advantages of the internal combustion engine is that the fuel is a very good store of energy so you can run for a long time. Um, so I just want to go through a sort of a theoretical example. Um, let's, if we look at sort of three different scales of, um, of uh, tractors, um, if we assume some that tractors are used at 50% of the, the kilowatt um, rating, and make some assumptions about the, the the mass and volume density of and price of of, of batteries. If we um, say we've got a 50 kilowatt tractor and we and we were to, to run it um, for four hours, the battery would need to be um, so we have the ability to run it for four hours without stopping. The battery would need to be 100 kilowatt um, hours, which would weigh about 0.7 tons and occupy 200 liters, and probably cost in the order of forty thousand dollars. It's not. It's, it's not an implausible um, uh, uh, situation, um, but if we wanted to run it for t 12 hours, we'd need a 300 kilowatt hour battery that would weigh, and that would weigh two tons, almost as much as the, as a, the normal tractor and, um, and it would cost $120,000. So it was probably m more than the cost of the, of the, of that, of that tractor. Um, and if we look at other tractors, we, we sort of see similar trends, but it gets, as the tractor sizes increase, um, the, the mass and the size of the battery becomes even more unreasonable. So I guess the, the, the takeaway is that the, the batteries could potentially work for, for small battery powers, could, could work for small tractors and short operating times, but not for long operating times and, um, and larger tractors. And so on the topic of these small tractors, there's been a couple of um, uh, of 50 kilowatt tractors, electric tractors that have been um, displayed at trade shows and stuff. So there's there's a Swiss um, tractor that was just has been um, talked about since 2018. Sorry, um, and then then there, that's uh, and that's set to go into production um, and become commercially available in 2021. And then probably the most well-known one is the is is Fence E100. Um, that was displayed at Agrotechnica in 2017. Um, so I understand that it was at the 2019 edition as well. Hasn't entered series production yet. They've been doing more tests and stuff, but I understand there's going to be an update in um, in in September on what the you know on, on what the what the future of that is, whether it's being released or there's more developments, etc. Um, so looking at that that Fent um, E100, so this is a this, this has got a, a 100 kilowatt hour battery, so it's a bit like that that example I went through before. Um, so if we can get, so you can only get four hours use, maybe four or five hours use. Um, so it can be charged in a few different few different ways. You can you can charge it um, with a 22 kilowatt um, AC charger. So if we, very roughly, if we work out the charge time, 100 kilowatt hours divided by 22 kilowatts, it's, you know, it's about five hours. Um, so that sort of charging strategy, you know, could, could work over, for overnight charging, um, but it's, it's gonna be, it's too slow for, for if you wanted to use it in the morning and then charge it at lunch and then use it in the afternoon, that sort of thing. Um, 
then it can also be charged um, with a, a by a 140 kilowatt DC um, charging. So if you if you do that sort of charging, it's can be could be fully charged most of the way charged anyway in in less than less less than an hour. Um, so that could be potentially okay for a recharge at lunch, but you need access to a, a DC supercharger, um, and that infrastructure is not generally um, you know wide, widespread at the moment. Um, so just trying to thinking through what what how this might be Im improved in the in the future to get sort of faster faster charging that could could make that sort of uh, midday charge and continue in the afternoon possible. Um, so you could be faster AC charging. I mean, some other equipment um, there's there's uh, is electric equipment's charged by 43 kilowatt AC charges. Um, so that would reduce the time from, you know, less than five to less than three, but it's still too slow for a recharge at lunch. And I guess some of these things you probably, I'm, I'm not sure on the, the electricity supply at, at some vineyards, but it could start to be a restriction. And the other thing, you could install your own um, DC supercharger, maybe not quite as big as what's in this, this picture here, but maybe that could be an option. And, and if you're a, a, a a larger company with several tractors and you, you needed constant access to it, that might be the way you'd have to, you'd have, you'd have to go. Maybe it could be off grid solar panels and, 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 and battery. Um, but you know, the cost um, that would have to be um, investigated. Um, it's, there's even faster charge. I mean, that was, uh, I think it was 140 kilowatts is what is being used on the, on the, on the, the fent. But um, you know, Tesla, uh, their latest uh, equipment, they're talking about 250 kilowatt max charging with their superchargers and, you know, and that gets the charging time down to half an hour. But the big problem with these sort of higher charging rates is that it degrades the battery life. Um, so this is, um, yeah, that's, a, that's an important consideration. Um, there's actually some good data on the internet from uh, of the the impact of supercharging on on battery um, on battery battery health. Um, so this is from a I think it's from a fleet management uh, company that's got lots of electric vehicles looking at how their battery um, health degrades over time. And they've they've got um, they're looking at the vehicles that were were never never um, charged with a DC supercharger and and then charged up to you know right through to charge more than three times a month and you can see that the the battery definitely degrades um, more as it's um uh, as it's uh, uh, when it's been DC supercharged and and probably the DC supercharging that would have been used in this case would probably generally been at lower kilowatts than 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 we're talking for those for those um, for the for the tractors. Um, so it's probably to solve this sort of issue and allow that really fast cha charging, it's probably comes down to new battery designs. Um, and, and really it's probably following what the, the automotive sector does. I mean, they've probably got the, the volume and the, and the, and, and the, the money to, to push the developments and then, and then, um, agricultural uh, manufacturers could, could, could follow that. So I guess given the problems with the, the um, batteries, if you, for, larger, for larger tractors, you've probably seen this before, this is um, people have experimented with lots of different approaches, looking at how they um, sort of manage mobile and stationary batteries and, and even connecting um, uh, a tractor to the, to the grid. This is um, a John Deere uh, research project that's, that's quite, um, quite quite interesting i mean it's it's probably not maybe that that practical but i think it's it's, it's an interesting step sort of weighing up the the different ways that you could uh, kind of can approach uh, charging and or, or, or autonomy um so yeah so it's and it's it's fascinating it's in some of the john deere presentations and and when you look on the internet there's there's actually lots of these uh, um old uh like soviet um era tractors that that have long long uh, charging charging cables um and then yeah and then and then other also sort of old agricultural vehicles from a, you know, around 1900 and stuff that uh, that have um have uh, are, are electric and working with cables 
So moving to tractor implements, so I guess at the moment tractors are it's mainly mechanical PTOs and hydraulics and you can only get a little bit of electricity from the existing systems. So there's been a, a lot of interest uh, from the manufacturers, probably more so than um, uh, in, in, in sort of looking at providing um, electric power to tractor implements. And they've probably done more on this than, than on the electrically powering the tractors them, themselves. And, um, and they've developed, have demonstrated various concepts probably over the last, last 20 years. This is a picture here of an old um, John Deere E-Premium tractor from around 2007 that had um, electrical um, power at a generator and, and electrical um, power um, in, installed. I don't, I don't think it was a success that, 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 that model, but you know, it's, they've been working on it for, for a long time. Um, and so and the manufacturers, they've been working on it for a while, but they're, they're still working to standardize the interface between tractors and implements. And they've got a, um, there's a group called the Agriculture Industry Electronics Foundation that's got all the big supply manufacturers involved and, and, they're, and they're, they're, they've been working on that. Um, but it's generally accepted that there's going to be sort of a high voltage um, supply for a power supply and then a, a low of sort of higher than 12 volts, but you know, 48 volts or so for, for powering other equipment. Um, so, I mean, it has been going for quite a while. As I said, the people have been working this for the last 20 years and without that much commercialization, um, there's sort of a few reasons. It's, you know, if there's no, if there's not an easy supply of electricity, you know, do you build implements to, to for that? And, and if there's no um, great um, implements, do you supply um, electricity from your tractor? Um, and you really need to sort of, Gets, there needs to be some reason to 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 do it to take it, something to take take advantage of the electric motors and controls you know precision and efficiency. Um, so I mean there are things like John Deere have some seeding equipment that um, is one example that that takes advantage of electrical motor precision to very precise seeding, um, and um, and and I guess this is was quite this this um this paper by uh, Ra and Resch and they were they were talking about that most of the energy use in the tractor is mainly from driving traction rather than than other implement motors so even if you increase the efficiency it doesn't save doesn't save doesn't save that much in in, in the scheme of things so um i guess this is uh, leads to uh, a, a recent development where um where they are trying to use that um electrical power um to, to for, for for traction and, and drive this is um uh, john deere launched a new uh, electrical uh, mechanical power split uh, continuously variable transmission with um a high power um electric pto or power off off boarding um at the agritechnica in 2019 and this is this is going to enter um series production it's not just a, a research project um so you know and they're, they're so they're they're are um, realizing some some genuine genuine benefits from driving those those wheels on the on the on on the trailer, um, and it's a, it's a similar general concept like for the continuously variable transmission to the the hydrostatic mechanical power split power split um, you know CVT you know Fent Vario and 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 and, and similar so maybe that is a, a way that the um, that the uh, electric um, power off, off boarding electric PTO will, will, will take off. Um, and I, I guess like sort of talking about things that are uh, electric and happening in, in other, other sort of agricultural sectors, but there are already some electric vehicles in um, being used in, in vineyards. This is a, um, the Technoma Voltus electric, electric straddle tractor. And there's about 10 of these in use in France, mainly in Champagne. That's been commercially available since 2015. I think it won an award a couple of years before. And I think it was also won by a company called Creamer as well. Um, and they, you know, some of the implements are, are driven electrically, um, but there's hydraulics as, as well. And then there's other things that, that used to use electric motors. I mean, Palenque had a, an electric trimmer, and and they had a, a pruning pruning system that used hydraulics and 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 electric motors for some of the circular saws. So, so yeah, so that's but they're they're not that's all hydraulic again now. Um, and then yeah, Green Tech sells sprayers with um, uh, electric motors on the on, on for the fans. So, um, so I guess you know you'd have to question when is it going to come the electrification in vineyards. It, 
it probably seems like it's probably many, many years away um, still. Um, and I guess the questions are, you know, are the precision efficiency benefits of electric motors enough to, to, to make them, to make them worthwhile? I mean, it's probably, it's going to come at, probably come at some point in the future, but um, yeah. Um, maybe some of those um, electric robots that I've, I've talked about, that might be the pathway through which uh, um, electrification takes place in, in vineyards. So just concluding, concluding here, um, uh, where, where we're at. Um, so I think autonomous vineyard robots and tractors are, are getting closer. There's lots of developments in, in France. I think for people that are in, interested in it, there's a, a virtual uh, trade event that, that uh, agricultural robotics um, uh, show, a, a conference I, I mentioned that you can, you can sign up and see uh, and watch online. So and that's, that's very good. And I got lots of information that I've included in this presentation from some of the, the previous videos from, from that event. So I'd, I'd recommend that if, if, you're, if this is a topic you're interested in. Um, so yeah, I think the, the Vinod robots are, are, are interesting and, and we should be trialing them and stuff, but it's perhaps the, the cheapest initial path to automation, automation might actually be through some of those tractor retrofit kits. So I think that's something that's worth investigating. Um, I guess with all of these things, we're, we're probably really only gonna, gonna understand how well they work and once we, we get them here and trial them under, um, straight Australian conditions. I mean, there's a limit. I mean, I've spoken with lots of suppliers and looked at videos and stuff. And but it, I mean, there's there's a limit to what you can you can you can learn about these things without actually doing it. Um, so there's a uh, and there's yeah on the electrification. There's there's lots of there seems to be lots of developments in in sort of that electric tractors and implement space. And it it does seem like it is going to be happening. I think as I said, Fent are going to update their uh, um, you know what they're plans going forward after the 100 in September. So I think that's something to watch out for. Um, and I think we'll probably, the automotive sector is a lot bigger than, than the agricultural machinery sector and, and, and they have to keep produce things that keep, um, that, it, that, it, that, it, that are cheap. So, um, so I think that's probably, we'll probably follow what happens there to a, to a large extent. So, and that, yeah, so when stuff happens there, we can that can that can move into agricultural machinery. Um, I just want to thank, really thank any everybody. That I've, I spoke with lots of people when I was preparing this. Um, Pen Ricard and Brown Brothers, some 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 emails and visits and and um, phone calls with many suppliers and and um, dis distributors. Um, yeah, who were very very helpful. So I really thank you very much for that. Um, and um, yeah, I hope there was. That was that's interesting. Thanks for listening. Okay, fantastic. Thanks very much, Simon. Really comprehensive presentation there. Um, <clears throat> Simon's going to stick around now for a Q and A period. So if you've got any questions, now's your opportunity. Um, for a reminder, if you if you're not aware, to ask a question, click on the Q and A button in your Zoom toolbar. Type your question in and click to send it through. Uh, first question here we've got Simon is around current legislation. I know you touched on that briefly earlier, but can you expand a little bit on what the situation is there with regard to using uh, an unmanned vehicles in, a, in an Australian agri horticultural um, environment? So I guess my, uh, my understanding is that there are pretty few rules um, and uh, obviously there's, there's uh, there's worker health and safety rules and stuff that would, would need to be obeyed. And, and I mean, irrespective of what the rules are, you want to make sure it's, it's, it's safe. Um, but yeah, my, my understanding there's, um, there's, there's actually not a huge amount of rules. I would, I'd really recommend I've, um, uh, I've, I've got an article there where from Wiseman et al. And they've, they've actually go through some of the, the applicable um, rules. I don't have it in, in front of me, but, um, that's actually freely available on the, on the internet. So I'd recommend um, we might include that in the follow-up follow uh, email that goes around. So I'd refer to that, to that article for, for a bit of a summary on the, on the, the legislation. But there's, there's a lot of rules for on-road autonomous vehicles. But as I said, my understanding is that it's, it's not that tightly um, regu regulated. Um, but yeah, if, if anything did go wrong though, there's 
all the normal um, uh, rules in place and, you know, I can't, you'd want to be having uh, appropriate insurance in, in place and ultimately everybody being, being, being safe. Um, so, um, and you'd have to cons have to consider that and make sure your insurance companies aware of it and it's, et cetera. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I'm not an absolute expert on it. So I'll, yeah, bit of a disclaimer that you, you have to investigate a little bit more, but I'd start by reading that, that article. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks. We'll certainly make sure people have access. Well, I provided potential access to that paper, Simon. Um, just a related question. Someone's mentioned that if for a cabless or a, a tractor rather without a cab, uh, will there be issues with moving them from uh, farm to farm via via a road, presumably? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So as soon as it goes on the road, that's when it gets it gets really really tricky. Um, and as I said, I think while some of those demonstration vehicles often have um, have the demonstration tractors often don't have a cab, it's probably more sensible that they you pay the pay and get a, get the cab so you've got that flexibility but but for some of the other vehicles I, I mean it's it comes down to how the the vineyards um are arranged and as as much as possible i think you you want to get into a situation where you've got um you you don't have to use public public roads because as soon as you have to use public roads you're going to run into to 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 legislation and and even when we get um, uh, um, autonomous vehicles on our, our roads, and you know, Teslas are uh, um, they're they're all running, um, and they've got. I sort of wonder if some of the, the autonomous tractors are ever going to have the smarts of some of those of of, of those um, vehicles. So they might still not be able to run on 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 public roads. So yeah, this is. I think it's a real consideration how you um, how you set things up in the in the in the future. Yeah, definitely something to keep in mind. Um, on I guess a similar um, topic, are you aware of any injuries from autonomous slash semi-autonomous farm machines to date? And perhaps to expand on that, potentially any damage to farm other farm equipment or or crops? I'm I'm not. Um, you know. I've, probably there's probably been some some I, I don't know I, I i don't know i mean we the things i guess i know from what everybody else sees in the in the media about some of the uh some of the autonomous car crashes where people are supposed to have their hands on the wheels and on the wheel and and haven't that's that's sort of that sort of thing um i mean i think in the they've got various sensors usually so you would have seen on some of the vehicles they had a bumper that they that sensor is sort of the final layer of 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 protection um to, to shut the machine down but yeah it's it's always this is this i guess this is always the like i said it's the the two big things you've got to you've got to worry about you running into somebody or the machine leaving the um leaving the the farm so that's that's the two big things um and the quality of uh how how well they they manage things is going to be very dependent on the specific types of sensors that are that are, that are fitted to the fitted to the to the vehicle um so it's sort of a case by case um basis okay thanks simon um, are you able to comment on the life cycle aspect of, of the batteries? Um, you know, life, life expectancy, how are they refurbished, recycled, those types of things? Um, I guess only, only very, only probably only very, very generally, um, I guess the, the batteries do, 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 do degrade over, over time, um, and it depends on on use. Things like that, uh, the DC supercharging, um, uh, will affect the 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 bat battery life. Um, probably the best indications of of battery life are, are going to come from the, the automotive automotive sector, um, and there's lots of data on the 
uh, on the internet of, uh, of, 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 of how uh, starting to get, you know, batteries have been used for a long time on how they, and seeing, showing how they've, they've degraded. I mean, just in this example, I guess it's four years old. And if you didn't do any supercharging, it's down to 90% of what the uh, original uh, uh, life was. Um, and I guess a lot of this is, uh, uh, there'll probably be further developments as, as, as we go on and hopefully these, um, the things will, things will Im Im improve, but, yeah, it definitely degrades. It will degrade over time to some extent. Sure. Okay. And a somewhat related point, um, this might be a tricky one to address, Simon, but do you expect that automation and or electric electrification will or in the future would reduce carbon emissions? Yeah, I think it, it, it will. Um, it will definitely re reduce uh, carbon emissions. Um, I think the, uh, I mean, if we simply, if we're, we're using renewable, um, uh, re renewable um, electricity that's generated by solar or wind, as opposed to um, burning diesel, um, that'll reduce emissions. Some of these, um, e even when um, diesel is being used, even some of the autonomous vehicles can run more smoothly um, and more more efficiently and and um, the, than than operators. So um, so there's even potential um, benefits um, from that. Um, I mean, I think these. It's just a matter of um, it's these things are going to are going to happen. It's just how how quickly. Um, but yeah, and it'll it'll definitely reduce emissions. Great, thanks, Simon. Um, we've got here a question about green hydrogen and whether that is a light, whether that's likely to be a renewable option for tractors instead of electric. So, I mean, I haven't covered it in this presentation, and I'm not, I'm not an expert on it, but I know that um, that uh, C and H Industrial New, New Holland have done a lot of have done a lot of work on that topic fairly recently. Um, so, yeah, that's. That's something else that's that's out there. I've re I guess I've really focused on the electrification, um, but yeah, that's a, that's another thing that's out there. I can't I'm, I can't really comment on it too much, but I think that's um I I'd look at some of their their work. Um, maybe I could even do a few more investigations and send something 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 through about that potentially. Um, so yeah, that is something else. Is that they, that seems to be the thing that they're they're focusing on more so than like John Deere and, and Fenton stuff seem to be focusing more on the electrification and they're and they're sort of focusing a bit on that. Okay. Uh, I've also got a question here about whether there are any developments in combining drone technology with automated vehicles. Uh, the example is for powdery sensing sensing and then sending out another implement to uh, spot spray. I mean, it's been there's... hashtagged with a with a dreaming, so I think this might be a long <laughs> shot. But I mean, I've, I've, with the autonomous vehicle, I've I've stuck to the the ground based vehicles, but there's there's obviously all this various autonomous drone um, technologies being being developed. I mean, I guess it's probably the in some respects a lot of these things. It's the image recognition um, uh, ability that's probably the 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 trick the barrier in that in that in that that respect um, yeah and I, I guess in this presentation I've also tended to focus on things that are quite applied and seem uh, quite doable they're not they're, it's they're more things that are I guess they're things more probably that are replacing a a person rather than some fancy image recognition technology that I, I th might actually be like which is will happen at some point but it it's probably further away than just um and the business case might be harder than 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 just having a, a machine that runs by itself than instead of a somebody driving it um but yeah it's all could be possible <laughs> yeah. yes thanks simon um have you come across any automated pruning robots that apparently were being trialled some years ago and also an AI camera based bunch counting slash yield estimate systems. So the pruning robot, I, 
I mean, I remember reading that in magazines and seeing it presented at a conference, uh, you know, 10 years ago or, or something. Um, and I haven't, um, I, I did actually have a bit of a look to try and see if I could find that before, you know, with this presentation coming up and, and I, I couldn't, um, I mean, I, there's a lot of, I've, other people have said it before and they're talking about autonomous ro robots and stuff or is, there's, there's lots of cool videos on the internet of fruit picking robots and, you know, not, I can't, couldn't find the pruning one, but they're, they're pretty complex tasks. And, and they're also in the end, the speed becomes quite a big, um, big issue. So I don't, I don't think that's actually gone. Yeah. It doesn't seem to, it's obviously not very common. It hasn't, it's not popular in anyway. I don't think anybody's using it, but it's, it's not shown widely either. Um, so, and, and I guess a lot of these things, there's probably, there's, there's sort of mechanical s solutions that might not be as perfect, but they're, they're already, they're already here. So it's, it's harder to, to really justify on in, in, you know, pushing development of some of these other things because there's already something that's halfway there. Okay. Thanks, Simon. Um, have you got any idea of the weight of an EV tractor, specifically the E100, and how that would compare in weight to a, uh, a, a similar spec diesel option? So I think with the, um, with the E100, I have, it, it ended up being about the same weight. Um, so as I said, I think they're actually going to... Um, release uh, more information um, but I, I've heard the, the people from Fent say in interviews and stuff that it's it's about about the same um, like as when you get bigger tractors and if you're going to do higher um, operating times which needs longer batteries and it's much heavier but for for a small smaller battery and a smaller tractor it might not be that it's probably similar okay I uh, also got a question here about whether anyone is looking to produce slide in slide out batteries. Um, so I think that's people like John, John Deere. Um, I've, I haven't included a lot of much stuff that they've, they've done, but they've, they've got heaps of, um, of presentations and stuff on the internet where they are playing around with slide out batteries and uh, uh, yeah. And sort of, and, I, I guess yeah, stationary and mobile batteries. I think I, s I said here, yeah. So that that is a that's a, that's another option. I guess it's you have to think about how much effort that's that's going to going to be. Would you be? Um, be they're also doing work looking at sort of uh, having the using the tractor battery at other times when it's not operating as a as a battery to service the sort of the the farm. It's all in 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 interconnected. Um, so yes, people have done work looking at, at slide out batteries, but I guess you'd have to weigh up how much effort that is, particularly if they're very big, very big batteries. Um, so, I mean, even that one we're talking about in the Fent, I think, what, what did it weigh about half a ton or something? So, um, so yeah, that's, uh, you have to, have to, have to, have to weigh that, weigh that up. People I have looked, have looked at it. Um, yeah. Sure. Okay. Do you foresee any government incentives around adoption of this type of technology, either now or in the future? Well, um, I don't know. Um, I talked a bit about what's happening in, in France. And when I sort of started to in, investigate it, it, it really seemed that, that there's so much stuff going on and there was a, a lot of companies and research projects and sort of money coming from the the government in indirectly to sort of really push this stuff along i don't i'm, I'm not really sure if we've got that in us in australia and i guess we're a smaller smaller country and stuff so there's there's that that sort of aspect but um yeah i, I don't know if we if we're sort we're sort of a bit behind partly because yeah partly because of our, our size and stuff but they seem to be going to a lot a real a lot of a, a lot of effort um and we probably yeah we're 
we could be doing better maybe. Um, but I don't, um, yeah, I mean, there'll probably be grants at that, at that time that, that, that come up as, as people get interested in automation and, and, and things, but, um, but yeah, I don't know anything right now. Okay. Um, question here about whether low speed vineyard tractor navigation slash auto steer is possible less than than half a kilometer an hour for an operation such as mechanical pruning um whether that would be possible well i guess the the auto steering aspect of it should should be possible um i guess it's depends on the uh on the on the on the pruning itself if if there's complexities with that that are are going to cause cause issues um but um but yeah i mean the auto steering aspect should be should should be should be possible um great thanks simon um i've got a few more questions and we'll try and get through them all i know we've run over time we've got a question here about whether you've seen the GUSS, G-U-S-S, autonomous sprayers for almonds. I I haven't, um, but I'm going to look at, was it G-U-S-S? -S? I will look it up though, because it's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, are there any, are you aware of any vineyards in Australia that already have an integrated autonomous system um, in their everyday business? No. But I, I mean, there could be, but no. I mean, I don't think there's any, I don't even think there's many people with auto steer on, on, on tractors. That's one of those sort of things that is, you know, a few people are doing it very su successfully, but and I know a few people are doing it, but it's I, even that sort of thing I don't think is widely used. Sure. Okay. And this, I think we'll make it a last question. Do you know the cost of these units and it's specifically around the Vidi bot. Yep. Um, it's about, uh, I got some rough, rough numbers and I think it was for the, for the spec'd up system with all the, um, the implements, it was about worked out as about $300,000, I think. So that was, that was, I mean, there was a cheaper model with not as powerful, uh, motors and stuff like that, but, I'm sort of assuming that you went right to the top. It was three hundred thousand dollars. Thank you. Great. I think we'll leave it there with regard to Q and A. Simon, was there anything you wanted to add before we start to wrap this up? Uh, no, that's that's everything. Um, yeah, thanks for thanks for listening. Okay, fantastic. Thanks very much, Simon, for um, providing some really important insights into the autonomous robot slash electric tractor markets. Um, thank you also to everyone that joined today's session. Um, for attendees, you will, as usual, receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording of this session. There'll also be a link to access the paper that Simon mentioned earlier. Um, acknowledgements also to Wine Australia for providing funding and support for, for webinars via the AWRI Extension Project. The next AWRI webinar is scheduled for the 3rd of September. Sadly, I can't confirm the topic right at the moment, um, but we will be releasing details around that shortly. Um, so stay tuned via the usual channels. Thank you again, and I look forward to seeing you at the next AWRI webinar.